than he turned out to be. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think he was expecting to die at age 62, uh, Jackson. And, um, yeah. Yeah, he went and did go for quite quickly. Like that. Don, were you destined to be a lawyer? Was that your background? My father was a lawyer. Was he? He died when I was very young. Uh, I think I was 13 or so. He, he, was a, he was a partner of Clarence Darrow. Oh, no kidding. Uh, he had been the, one of the prosecutors of the Loeb Leopold case, which was a famous case in Chicago. And uh, Your father was part of that? Was part of the, one of the prosecutors, yes. Wow. And then after that, and then, and then after that case, he and two fellows named Smith came out and opened an office, and Clarence Darrow walked in and said, "Fellows, can I become a partner?" So for the last ten years of my father's life and Clarence Darrow's life, they were partners. And by coincidence, the house I was brought up in, which my father bought shortly thereafter, was the full house that had formerly been the Leopold House, and that was the. That was my boyhood residence. Wow. That, that was in what, Chicago proper? Or yes, in, it was in, in, in Kenwood, which is the part of Chicago, which is fairly close to the university. And it was the chic part of Chicago in the 19th century and the early 20th century. No oh, is this uh, is. Prairie Avenue? Is it down no, there? Prairie Avenue was also another chic part. That's further west. Okay. okay. This is near, much nearer the university. Okay. So your dad died at an you know, early age, yet you had an interest in law? I always did. And uh, when I got out, of, I, uh, I, I was taken into the Army. Uh, at, the, at the University of Chicago, we had a system in those days where you could begin law school after only two years of college. And I did that largely. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do in life, but that seemed to be as good a thing as any. And of course, I, I remembered a famous statement of my father's, which I repeat very often: that working, no, being a lawyer has a lot of disadvantages, but it's better than having to work for a living. So then, then what, when I was in the army, uh, I, 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 various places, I had occasion to read law books, and suddenly I met a lot of lawyers, and my interest got very much extenuated then. And when I came back from the army, um, older, more mature, I was then really, really fascinated with it, and, and couldn't very well see anything else that I, I could possibly want to do. Before I leave your, your, your father, did he ever talk about Clarence Darrow? Do you recall any? Sure. A little bit. But see, that was so many years ago. I can remember him mainly as a very funny looking little man who used to bring his lunch into the office. Mm -hmm. And at those days, he wasn't very active. He was already, I think, in his late 70s or so. Uh, but uh, he was. He had used his um, fame as a criminal lawyer to get a lot of um, business clients, including, for example, the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad, I think was one of them. And that was my father's function, was to handle the, the non-criminal aspects of, of Darrell's profession. All of this I remember very, very vaguely. Sure. Was there an acquaintance between your father and Jackson? They had met. Uh, I know they had met, and because I, my mother told me yeah, long after my father was die, died that I had a very strong desire to try to get to be a Jackson law clerk, and she told me that uh, that that, that, they, that they had met on one occasion, but that's all. Do you know if that was through bar association? No, I think it was in connection with some kind of a, of, of a litigated matter. Describe the path that finds you as Justice Jackson's law clerk. Well, when I was ready to get out of law school, 
the dean of the law school appointed, said he was going to recommend three of us as law clerks at the Supreme Court. And I immediately said, I am only interested in working for Justice Jackson. And so he said so. And um, at that time, Jackson didn't want me. He had somebody or for some reason or other. He wasn't, he wasn't interested. Why was Jackson the only interesting clerkship scenario for you? I had just fallen in love with what I had written, read of his, of his work. Okay. And I think I'm not un unique in that respect. Uh, that's, it's, that's uh, what got it's, me first too. it's just such great literature, makes such good sense, and for any lawyer, it's, it's what, you, what we all would like law to be. So uh, then I did have occasion, I did have occasion some two or three years later, after in the meantime I'd become a prosecutor and I'd gone to work for a law, law, law firm in Wall Street, I just wrote a letter to Justice Jackson and said, uh, you didn't want me three years ago, but maybe you could use me now. And strangely enough, he asked me to come in and see him. And uh, uh, I got offered the job. At the time, <coughs> Bill Rehnquist was the clerk there. He had already been there for half a year before. Did you talk to him at all before you came down for the interview? No. no. I'll tell you who I did talk to before was Phil Neal, because I, I knew Phil uh, in, in Chicago. I knew his sister. And, uh, on a personal basis. On a personal that was basis. Phil was teaching in Chicago. Right. Right. He was yeah. still out in California, probably. He was, but um, uh, he, had, he, had, he had a sister who was in college at the University of Chicago. And okay. I guess it was through her that I met Phil. And Phil was always a very enthusiastic Jackson man. Mm -hmm. Pretty difficult to work closely with him and not be. No. Did he give you any tips? Did Phil Neal give you any tips as to how to approach Justice Jackson? I can't remember. We touched on this at lunch. Bernie Meltzer, who had been with Jackson at Nuremberg, was one of your law professors in Chicago. Yes. But you know, at the time, I really didn't, I didn't, wasn't even aware of the fact that Bernie had been at, at, uh, at Nuremberg. Okay. So Bernie wasn't a recommender? Or didn't no, he play, wasn't. Didn't no. Bernie, we got to be a pretty good friend. Right. Uh, and I knew that he had done all kinds of interesting things during the war, right. but I wasn't, it somehow didn't strike me that he'd been in Nuremberg. Uh, I had been, uh, during, while I was in the Army, I was uh, an intelligence officer in the Pacific and was what is called as an order of battle officer, and it was my function to learn the order, the Japanese order of battle, to know all about all of the Japanese units who were there, who their commanders were, what their troop strength were, what their artillery was, uh, what their location was, and so forth. So when the war was over and I went to Tokyo, they needed somebody for exactly, with exactly that background at General MacArthur's headquarters for the so-called legal section. And so I got sent there. Now the legal section was involved in the prosecution of what you might call the second class war criminals. There was a, an entirely different group of lawyers with whom I had nothing to do who were prosecuting the big shots, the tojos and so forth. And, and then my group were prosecuting POW camp commanders uh, army officers who had killed prisoners, people who had uh, unquestioned criminals. But uh, I, I did therefore have some opportunity to engage in the prosecution of those peoples. And I think that might have been one of the things that uh, had caused Jackson to have a little interest in me, is to see that how the other end of the war tribes prosecution was uh, operating. From your end, were you aware of Jackson oh, and sure. Nuremberg? Oh, and sure. Oh, sure. That was great news. Okay. And uh, uh, it was, uh, <coughs> the, uh, when, when he made his famous opening address in Nuremberg, I was still in the Army. Right. But uh, it, it, it was printed, and it was, of course, 
probably the greatest piece of legal reality that's ever been written. And it answered all of the questions that could possibly have been risen. And uh, I'm just sorry that President Bush didn't read it before he decided to declare war on Iraq. <laughs> So you find yourself applying, you do the interview. Do you recall anything about the interview itself? That I remember. It was a great deal I don't remember. But strangely enough, I do remember that. Because, uh, he said, how, how many years of applying did it take to actually get in the door? No, I think this was only the second time the second I'd time. applied. Okay. Yeah, but okay. it, was, it was at least, I think it was three years after the original application. Okay. Okay. Um, he, he said, so you have a, an interest in uh, doing, you know, engaging in the work of this court. Uh, and I said, no, sir, I'm interested in the work of this justice. And he then explained, well, at least in my chambers, it works pretty much that way. My law clerks work pretty much with you. There is some work also with the, some of the other law clerks and some of the other justices, but it's mainly a, a, a one boss operation. And uh, I th that much I do remember. I also, then it was a second time when I, because at that time he didn't offer me the, he didn't offer me the job. Uh, he brought me in and introduced me to, to uh, <coughs> uh, to, to Mrs. Douglas, and I'm sure that her opinion was pretty crucial mm -hmm. in, in all of that. But uh, shortly thereafter, I did get the notice that uh, the job was mine if I wanted it. And strangely enough, I didn't jump at it. I dithered because I had, in the meantime, gone back to my law firm in New York, and I was Rather, at that, at that time at least, I was older than most of the other law clerks. Mm -hmm. And it took me a, f a couple of weeks, and he was very patient. He said, okay, take as much time as you want. But then uh, well, I, I finally said, yes, sir, I would like to come. And then I came down, and I remember my first day I reported for work. That's another conversation I remember, among the many that I forgot. But the one, one I remember on that occasion was that he explained to me that he had come up a young lawyer in upstate New York where he interviewed the client, he collected the facts, he did the legal research, he prepared the pleadings, he did the trial brief, he conducted the trial, he made the post-trial motions, he submitted the briefs. If there was an appeal, he submitted it and he tried the trial. And it, was his, it was his method of working was he would be the guy who did everything. And he said, I was the despair of some people in the Justice Department because even when I got with all those hundreds of lawyers, I still had a tendency to just mark out certain things where I was going to do it mainly myself and just only loosely look after what was being done by the others. Uh, and he said, now, on this court, I'm the guy who's going to do the opinions. That doesn't mean I'm not going to ask for your help but that's going to be my responsibility. You and Rehnquist are the guys who are going to look after the cert petitions. Now, that doesn't mean you can do anything you want to. I'm going to check what you do, and we'll talk about it. But that's your responsibility, and that's the way it's going to work. And with a few exceptions, that's the way it did work. From discussions we've had with other clerks of Justice Jackson, They've been consistent in saying that Justice Jackson did his own work, but somehow during the course of the term, he would make available at least an opportunity for one opinion to be uh, written by the clerk. Did you have that A experience? first draft. Yeah, in fact, I, 
in a sense, I had two. Uh, but in neither case was it really uh, the opportunity to write a full-scale draft. But first, there was the case of Stein against New York, a very interesting case. It was then. It's now outmoded because it was before Miranda. Uh, and under Miranda, those people would have been kicked out. But it was a, it was a coerced confession case, or a case where the defendants had confessed and then later contended that it was coerced. Although they never took the stand, they had criminal records a mile long, so they couldn't take the stand, and they all, all they did was uh, let it be shown that they had a few bruises here and there. And uh, it was a New York case, and under the New York procedure at that time, it was the jury that decided whether the uh, the, the, whether the confession was coerced or not. When the case came up on certiorari, it was before I was there, and Bill Rehnquist wrote the cert note. And Bill was immediately f had, his, had his eyes stricken out by a statement in the brief of the petitioners saying, in effect, this was taken from the argument to the jury of the defendants. And ladies and gentlemen of the jury, don't worry yourself about a silly little murder. That's of no importance. The only question of any importance is whether or not the police here committed atrocious acts to these defendants. Now that Bill, when he saw that, went through the roof. And he then wrote a big note to Justice Jackson about it, and he, cam he campaigned, and he worked into the case very carefully. And he came up with this notion, which he tried to sell Jackson, that this is a marvelous opportunity to come out and say that even if these co confessions were coerced, that's just harmless error. There was enough there to convict everybody, even without the confessions, it should be harmless error, and we should let it go at that. Uh, Jackson was not prepared to go that far. The fact that the rest of the courts were not. He did go almost that far because he did, in effect, say in his opinion that under the New York system, we really can't be sure whether the jury decided that the confessions were coerced or not, or whether they decided they were coerced, coerced, but they were guilty nevertheless on the other evidence, and we can't say that's unconstitutional. That was as far as he could go. Uh, Rehnquist has since come out, since he was Chief Justice, in a couple of concurring opinions, and he come out with this notion that the, you know, there can be a harmless error in, in the event of a coerced confession. But the, all that is background to explain why he, he called me in and then he, he asked me to occupy myself with his case. He said, first of all, that I've had an awful lot of arguments with Rehnquist about it. I know how he feels. I think it'd be better if you worked on it. And secondly, uh, this is all New York law. And you're a New York lawyer. You've been practicing there recently. And, and there, perhaps there was a time when I had all this stuff in my head, but I don't any longer. Mm -hmm. So uh, w would you at least draft up the facts, the contentions of the parties, and then I'll take it from there, so, uh, which, which, is, which is what happened. Uh, the other case uh, was the case of Lawrenson against Larson, where, again, it wasn't asking to draft an opinion. He, what he did was he asked me to, to prepare a rather long comparative study, some of which he used and some of which he did not, concerning the application of various U.S. maritime statutes to American ships and foreign ships in the course of, of their commerce. Uh, but that, 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 I think, is about all I can say that I did. Uh, uh, of course, in, in many of these opinions, uh, I would have some input because 
you may have heard this from other clerks, very often when we first got a draft of an opinion from Jackson, it was not that glorious, polished, brilliant prose that you're accustomed to. It was nothing much more than an outline of ideas and an awful lot of work had to be done on it. And, uh, and we did do that, although uh, <coughs> even with it, in those cases where I had occasion to draft something originally, by the time he got through with it, it didn't look like something I'd done. It always looked like something he had done. His method was very heavy on rewriting. Many times, many yes. Times, yes. Many times. Okay. And it was not, it didn't come out easy. He worked on it very hard. Now, as far as the research, research is concerned, which is what most of the law clerks did, they were spending most of their time doing research, uh, Jackson had in his head every single case in the U.S. reports from 300 on. Uh, he would sometimes have to reach up and get a book to get the page number because he knew the he knew the volume, he knew the name of the case, he knew what was the position of the parties, what was held, what the dissent was. He sometimes had to get the book down to get the page number. But other than that, as long as we're talking about U.S. reports, that was the research. He just did it in his office. Now, a case like in, in, in the Stein case where it happened to be a lot of New York law involved and he said almost apologetically, you know, it's been so long since I've been a New York lawyer, I'm not going to need a little help on this. So we did occasionally. And, and Bill Rehnquist used to do a lot of research just on his own initiative. He'd find various interesting cases probably that would come up. Uh, uh, and I, I think I probably did it too, although not as much as he did. Would these be granted cases or they would just be petitions? On both. On both. On both, okay. yeah. Uh, we had to do a pretty thorough job on the petitions, you know, he, he would, unlike some of the other clerks. He insisted on that. He said, we can read the record. And uh, if necessary, look for things in the record that aren't even mentioned in the briefs. And we did, we did do that. Would he rely entirely on your cert memos or would he look oh, at the no. petitions? No, no, no. He, uh, uh, I did have more than one occasion when he came to a conclusion different than I did on, on, the, on, the, on the cert memo. And the cert memo would be attached to the petition on the record and, and sent in to him. But he did surprisingly often uh, uh, go along, to my experience, go, go along with my recommendation. You know, after you've been there for a while, you know, I think 90% of the cases, you can pretty soon get a flavor of whether it's suitable or not. And, uh, <clears throat> Did you have much interplay with Justice Jackson during the process of, of your review of this cert? Did you go in and say, I don't know quite how to come down on this? And, 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 <coughs> I, I probably did, but you know, I just don't remember. Yeah. And then as far as, as the case worked its way through the court calendar. Did you find yourself listening to oral arguments? I often did, yes. Uh, it was one of the most, one of the interesting parts of the job, just to listen to the oral arguments. Can you categorize how Justice Jackson was as far as demeanor on the bench? Uh, <laughs> sure. Sure, he was a terror on some cases. He was he has very, very, ton, very, uh, Cutting, pertinent, embarrassing questions. Uh, one of the, uh, for, for example, the, the, the famous case of Brown against Topeka, mm -hmm. which was argued uh, when I was there, but not decided. This was December of 52? Right? When it was argued? Yeah. I can't tell you that, I can't tell you that the month that it was during that term. Yeah. And uh, well, first let me say, to, to, I'll take it chronologically, before the case was argued, right. both Bill and I had discussed the case at some length, and I do remember it, with, with Justice Jackson. And, I don't think he was just playing the 
devil's advocate, I really think he was saying what was on his mind, that um, he had pretty grave misgivings about reversing Plessy against Ferguson. You'll remember Plessy against oh, Ferguson sure. was the precedent that held it, that a separate but equal education was lawful. Uh, Transportation, not education. It's a railroad but, case. All right, 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 you're right. I stand corrected. Uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, we, and we, we actually wrote a couple of memoranda uh, on, those, on those points. When the case was argued, I was there in court, and I did hear him ask Thurgood Marshall a very embarrassing question, because Marshall would take him the position that the 14th Amendment prohibits special legislation based on the color of the person legislated against. Mm -hmm. And then Jackson said, how do you explain all of the special legislation about Indians? And Marshall never was able to answer that question. He mumbled something about the fact that perhaps the Indians didn't have the proper organization to, to, come, and, to come and dispute it. But um, the day when the cases were to be argued in conference, discussed in conference, there was that night a party of the law clerks and their wives. So I, on my own initiative, went into his office and told him that we were going to have a party of the law clerks and that I think it would be pretty wise not to talk to any of the law clerks about what went on in the conference. And uh, at least in our case, that's what happened. And once the conference was over, we never heard a word about that case until the final day of the term when it came down that the case had been put over mm -hmm. for re-argument. Uh, a few years ago, I saw on the French television um, a film which has obviously been made in English but dubbed in French about the Brown case. Mm -hmm and uh, told pretty much from the point of view of the Thurgood Marshall, the, the plaintiff's lawyers, but they, but they went through the what purported to be the whole story. And according to that uh, film, one of the reasons that the case was put over for argument was because Jackson had said that if you're going to come down to reverse Plessy, I will dissent. And rather than risk that, they decided to put it over. The uh, film also indicated that the following term, one by one, the, all, the, all the lawyers came on board. And I have told John about this. There was a dramatic scene where Justice Warren came in to see Justice Jackson in the hospital, because this was now he was already in, in ill health, and got his consent in the health in the hospital to to go along mm -hmm. with the with the majority of the case. Um, and by the way, in a, in a book I've recently read of Judge Posner, Judge Posner speculating gave a view that what happened between the first and the second case was that the plaintiffs had come up with some expert testimony on the sociological consequences in later life of what happened as a result of the segregation during the school days and that he thinks that it was perhaps that delayed social sociological consequence which which persuaded at least some of the naysayers to to come over and, and vote with the affirmatives uh, but all of this which I'm now saying everything from and after the date when I heard the argument is all hearsay mm -hmm. I, I just uh, from, from, from entirely different sources I think it's entirely consistent with what Jackson had said prior to the argument. Prior to the argument, he's, 
I remember there were two main points, and they were two points which were written by us in two particular memoranda. One was the uh, inherent problem of reversing a decision on which very important institutions had grown up over the years. And in that respect, I do distinctly remember Jackson having told us beforehand that Justice Black had told him that if the Supreme Court declared segregation in school to be illegal, the South would fight. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, the second point, which, the second memorandum was more on the pointing out that you can't say anything that was terribly wrong about the decision of Plessy against Ferguson. There was a great, great deal of, of, of sense to it. Uh, it, it is interesting that at that stage, Black was one of his closest friends. Mm -hmm. um, and they were constantly in, in, and each other's, in and out of each other's offices. Were you asked at some point prior to the December 52 hearing to, to put into writing at some point a memorandum of, of thoughts concerning the problem? I think. But the memorandum I write, I think, memorandum that I write, the memorandum that Bill wrote, were both in response to requests from him. Mm -hmm. But I'm, it's been so long, I can't swear to it. But I, I think that's right. Now, I am sure this much that in the time of the, uh, I'm, at the time of the confirmation of Justice Redquist, there, he said that that memorandum was done at the specific request of Justice Jackson. Mm -hmm. And I have, uh, I think that's probably right. And I, I have certainly have nothing in, in my recollection to contradict that. It's just that I don't have any affirmative recollection of that, that that was so. But I think it's probable. Were you asked to sort of put down your thoughts on it, or did he give you a sense that? Uh... No, I think that these were, uh, uh, this, was along, this was along the line that he had started. Because mm -hmm. this, this, by the way, is also something which you will find in other Jackson works, the reluctance to reverse prior Supreme Court decisions where a way of life has grown up in, uh, around it. This, this, was a, this was not the first time that a, a thought of this sort had occurred to it. But as you put the your memos together for him. Did, did he tell you how to? I, I will remember one thing that I did in that memo, which I, which I was kind of proud of. Because this was not from him, this was from me. But to support his position, I found a decision of the highest court of South Africa, where they had found that decisions that had uh, taken away the rights of the Cape Coloreds to vote were unconstitutional. But since they had been relied upon and had been going on as a, as a basis for conducting elections for so many years, it was not incumbent upon them to do something about it. They merely remarked that it was unconstitutional and hoped that the parliament would do something about correcting it. Uh, and. Uh, that I remember, I, I put that in a memo. You perhaps remember having seen that. Uh, indeed, that was one of the reasons why there was such a fuss about it. I was a little afraid to come up and produce my copy of that memo because I was afraid that some reporter would get a hold of it and say that Rehnquist really was in favor of apartheid. <laughs> In those memos, in the normal course, like Brown, you gave those memos to Jackson, would he critique them? I, mean, I guess so. But he you didn't. And not, not to me. No, I don't. As far as I know, it's just uh, this. Uh, and, and I'm sure there were lots of other cases where I wrote. Well, in addition to the certain memos, there were probably. No, I, I do remember one specific case, for example. Right. And I'm sure there were lots of others, but one specific case in the in the in the Aerosmith case, a tax case, where the. Uh, uh, majority had decided in favor of the government on the question of whether certain gains were capital losses or ordinary losses. And Justice Black wrote a 
very cryptic opinion and said, these are capital losses, period. And so I wrote him a little note and said that this is what gets this court in trouble, where they take these complicated tax cases and reduce them just to the point of, of uh, re reading the English language. And he read it and he agreed, and he, and he decided to, to write a dissent, and, and he asked me to help him on the dissent. You know. On the uh, Rehnquist, you know, the confirmation you just talked about, was it uncomfortable for you to be brought in? Sure. Yeah. I was enjoying, a, I was skiing in Stad, and I didn't particularly enjoy being called in. My memory then was a great deal better than it is now. <laughs> But even at that time, uh, it, it wasn't perfect. I wasn't as absolute, absolutely certain as I should have been. But I, I did, and indeed, from the very beginning, there are certain details upon which Bill and I disagree uh, still. But on everything that's really important, we, we agreed. Did you get, I know that one of the critical parts is the memo that you wrote, was that your memo or was it just your reflection of what you thought Jackson was thinking? Look, it was a memo which Bill and I wrote and I signed and it was, it, it, it came as a, as a result of a, of, I don't know if it was a specific direction for him to write it or it was an effort to uh, further go along the lines of arguments that he had suggested. Sure. It was one or the other. Right. And likewise, on, this, on the other argument that Bill signed, I had more to do with that than he will admit. Right, right. Uh, there, there are some of the phrases in there which I, I know were mine. So, you know, the, the initials are yours is... The, the, we, you know, at desks right next to one another, and we were looking over each other's shoulders. And, <laughs> and uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff. And it also happened on occasion. That, in fact, this lawyer from the from the Times that called me this morning, called me about a case where I had written a cert note, and then Rehnquist had disagreed with the cert note, and so he had written a counter cert note, and that did, that did happen on a couple of occasions. I think he probably disagreed with me more often than I disagreed with him, but it but it did happen. Interesting. You guys different of, of different political persuasions. Not much. I was, I wasn't as quite as right wing as he. You know, both of us were quite tall. Both of us were of Swedish origin, and we used to. Uh, we were good friends, and and we used to go together to what we called the Court of Clerks, the special luncheon room where we all had lunch every day, or the fascinating luncheons, I might add. But I remember one day as we walked in, one of the other clerks said, huh, here they come, the tall gentleman of Swedish descent and the big dumb Swede. <laughs> <laughs> they never said which was which. <laughs> Whose line was that? Do you remember? I think it was Alex Bickle. Okay, I think you told me it was Alex Bickle. I think it was, but you know, so many years ago, right, right. it's difficult to be sure. <laughs> Sure, go ahead. No. The clerks, when they got together, just before we leave Brown, um, mm -hmm. uh, my category. But tell I, me I know you have a you have a different interpretation no, no, than no, I do. I, I'm still working on my interpretation. Um, th this all goes to Brown as a legal problem. How did Jackson think about segregation as a social problem? I can't really say that I have discussed it with him. I don't know. I don't know. My, my, my guess is, from the nature of the man, that he, he very probably would have liked to have seen it uh, uh, abolished by congressional action. Uh, I did try to interest him. I, I also tried to interest Rehnquist in now, there's a fellow named Berger who writes on the 14th Amendment. Have you read his work, yeah, his Ra books? Raoul Berger. Raoul Berger. Yeah. And this is the point that he made originally. At the end of the 14th Amendment, there's a sentence 
Congress shall have the ability by appropriate action to enforce this. And I have always thought it would have made sense to say that when you come upon some, something which is violative of the 14th Amendment, it's Congress that should declare it and not the Supreme Court. But so far, besides Berger, the only person who believes that is me. Uh, I certainly was never able to persuade either Jackson or Rehnquist. Did, as the discussion of the 14th Amendment's applicability to the Brown versus Board discussion, did you know whether Justice Jackson was corresponding with Charles Fairman at the time? Or did you? Don't know. That would, is that, I think that's, right, right. there was no. a lot going on there, yeah. He was. I, I wasn't aware of it. Right, right. There was an awful lot that he did of which I was not aware. Right. Among the clerks, as you got together in your special sessions, uh, was there a sense of, of first of all, the, the politics of the clerks? Were they pretty much sure. liberal? And sure. And the clerks, of course, all had their own political senses, which were not necessarily those of their bosses. Uh, the clerks were all envious of Rehnquist and me for working for Jackson, too, because he was obviously the great mind on the court, the one that was the most interesting. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> some of the clerks, of course, had much greater responsibilities than we did. Uh, Jackson liked to joke about, uh, I've learned from your book that he never really liked Murphy. And he certainly had a very low opinion of Murphy as a Supreme Court judge. But he, he, he did, he told me once uh, that he used to get Murphy somewhere on the, in, in the couloir and he'd say, um, uh, uh, Frank, you know what? That opinion of yours, uh, I've got a couple of questions. I'd, I'd like to talk to you about it. And Frank would always say, oh, sure, Frank, sure, Bob, but I can't do it right now. I've got to go to my chambers, but I'll come back. So then Murphy would go back to his chambers, and he'd talk to the law clerk who had written the opinion, and he'd get himself briefed, and then he would come in and talk to Jackson about it. And uh, according to Rehnquist, this I don't know of my own knowledge, but according to Rehnquist, uh, Jackson told Rehnquist that Murphy's law clerks should be confirmed by the Senate. <laughs> did, the, did the majority of the justices use their clerks in a much yes. more usable way than... Yes, yes, they did, they did much more. Uh, almost all of them had their... their uh, their, 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 their clerks did, did at least the first drafts. And in fact, did just about everything except vote at the, uh, some of them anyway. Uh, strangely enough, another one who didn't lose his clerks very much is Douglas. Uh, Douglas, in fact, uh, had two clerks, but one of them never came to the, never came to the office because it was a mistress of his who was not even a lawyer, but who was drawing the salary. I, I, I shouldn't say that now. Because I'm liable to get sued for libel. I, just, but, uh, we won't publish this. Uh, uh, please don't. No. Her name. He, he certainly can't sue you. That's right. And in, in this Bruce Murphy biography of Douglas, uh, so much is aired out. Uh, I'm not sure that there are many damaged claims left in this area. <laughs> right. yeah. Strange, but he had this. The, the one, the one justice he didn't get along with was named Douglas. That the one person he got along with most was named Douglas. Right, right. <laughs> well, talk about the relationship between Jackson and Douglas. Was it just completely estranged? Well, they were very close, but I, whether there was a romance there, I honestly don't know. And if I did know, I wouldn't say, but I don't, I, I have no reason. I, I've heard all of the rumors that you have heard, but they were very fond of each other, and Bill and I were both very fond mm -hmm. of Elsie, mm -hmm. and she was very fond of us, but I don't think either of us was sleeping with her. <laughs> yeah. Nicely played. Uh, yeah. Uh, on the other no, and she was. Ago. By the way, she was extremely. She was a superb secretary. She was very, very helpful, both both to Justice Jackson and to us. And uh, she, she, 
she she pretty well ran the office. She she was a marvelous woman. Would either of them, Justice Jackson or Elsie Douglas, reminisce about Nuremberg? I'm sure that Justice Jackson did. And I have a very vague recollection of few th very few things. I do know, for example, that he told me that he considered that that was the most important thing that he had ever done in his life. And then another place where it came up was uh, I'll backtrack a little bit. Going through the decisions that were given to him by the court to read, to write while I was there, I was struck by the fact that so many of them were what you might call legal hem stitching. They were matters of procedural law without a lot of sex appeal to them where the other members of the court thought, what the hell, we, we might as well give those to a lawyer to do because they're there so, so, so very obvious legal. So as a result, he had more than his share of procedural problems to deal with. But he also said, with reference both to what he'd seen in Germany and what he'd known about Russia, he'd, al he'd often said that their systems of substantive law were not that bad. What was bad about them was that the elementary rights under the procedural law were not available to citizens. And you probably remember in, in one of his, I think actually it was in the Matsai case, uh, where he had the statement, he said, give it a choice, I would rather live under Soviet law administered by our procedural system rather than our law with the Soviet procedural system. And it was in this connection, I think he, 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 he did point out the fact that that was the thing that was the really big difference with Nazi Germany, the fact that they trampled on all of the procedural rights that were involved, and that was one of the things which made him so convinced of the very great importance of procedural rights. That, that I do remember. But I don't certainly don't remember any discussions. I, I'm sure, for example, I've never, I, I don't remember any discussions about his cross-examination. Uh, I wish I had, but, uh, but uh, I don't. Um, and what about Elsie? Would she reflect on no, aspects of the Nuremberg No, year? not that I remember. Okay. And I know in the chambers on the wall there were various photographs or mementos, yes. painting of the courthouse, that, yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, did he have the flags on the wall over his, the four nation flags? I don't remember. Your time as a clerk? I don't remember. Okay. Speaking of the other Douglas, William Douglas, uh, what was the relationship there? Uh, between Jackson and William Douglas? Uh, William, uh, Jackson quite disliked William Douglas. Mm -hmm. It even comes out occasionally in some of the opinions, you know, in the, in the Rosenberg opinion, where he goes to some trouble to show how Douglas had screwed all of that up. Right. Um, I think with, with the exception of Douglas, he had pretty good relationships with everybody on the court, although the only ones that were close friends were black and frankfurter. And uh, I've told you this before, that he never had lunch with his colleagues. He always had lunch alone in his chambers. Uh, and he, he did explain one day that he hadn't come up to the top of his profession for the purpose of talking about baseball every day at lunch. Uh, Chief Justice Vinson had been a semi-pro baseball player and it was the one, it was one of the things in which he excelled, I guess. So he steered the conversation around the baseball. Uh, that was, it was not, wasn't anything that Jackson had anything against baseball, but there were other things that interested him more. And also, by having lunch in his chambers, he could occasionally ask his law clerks in to, 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 to talk about it, the problems that had come up during the day. And the lunch would be provided by uh, Mr. Parker? Yes, Harry. Harry. Yeah, he had it there every day. Talk, talk, to, about, talk to us about Harry Parker. Harry Parker played the role of the old black retainer. 
And whether it was something which he enjoyed playing or whether he put it on or not, I don't know. He was obviously devoted to Robert Jackson. Uh, I remember that when, um, <laughs> I remember one of his lines, when, when, when Mary got married, she, uh, he said, well, the husband, their family's all ready. All he's got to do is come in and hang up his hat. <laughs> and, uh, would, would Harry Parker interact substantively with the law clerks? No. Chat with you or tell stories? I mean, you know, well, he might have. I, there again, you're Passing getting, the, 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 there, there again, my memory is really not very good. Well, I, 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 uh, I, I really can't say that Robert Jackson treated him as a friend. No, he treated him as, as, as a, and, and I don't think that uh, Bill Rehnquist and I treated him as a friend. Harry Parker had worked for McReynolds before he worked for Jackson. I think I heard that someplace, you know. But McReynolds' stories, for instance, weren't things that Harry Parker shared. Mm. Not that I know of. I know that one day McReynolds former law clerks. McReynolds had just one law clerk, you know, and he was still alive uh, in, when I was there, and he came in one day uh, and talked to Rehnquist and me, telling us how we ought to decide a certain cert petition. Was he a litigant? And was he an attorney involved he, in the matter? I don't think he was an attorney in record, but I think he had an interest. Well, we were pretty shocked, I right. imagine. Right. And, uh, matter of fact, I think I even, I even sent a note to the justice about it. Right. It is interesting. Mm -hmm. you, it was Strange I should remember that after all these years. <laughs> and there's so much that's so important that I've forgotten. I have a, before we leave, Bill Douglas. Did you ever get a sense from Jackson or elsewhere that his relationship once had been better with Bill Douglas, that they had once even been friends. Yes, I did get that. And also got a relationship from, you know, uh, Bill Douglas, like me, worked for Bruce Bromley and when he was a... Uh, uh, at at Cravat. Yeah. And uh, Bruce said that, uh, that Bill was a delightful young man. Everybody liked him. Uh, so uh, he, he was apparently somebody who, who did not improve with age. Mm -hmm. did, did you tell me a story about Douglas coming into a cocktail party in the Jackson Chambers? I was in, co I don't remember it. Uh, no, Jackson used to have cocktail parties in his chambers and, you, and it was really the chance to see everybody who really mattered in Washington would be there. Okay. But I honestly don't remember. I think I would have remembered if Douglas had come in. Who, who were the the Jackson crowd from, from outside oh. the court? What kind of people? Oh, senators and cabinet members and you know, all kinds of famous people. Uh, slightly pertinent, I remember one day, he had an awful lot of conversations with a lot of people that I never knew about in his office. And one day he came out of his office and he said that Senate, I've forgotten his name, but it was a senator had been in to see him uh, and wanted to get his, his support on, in connection with some kind of legislation. And Jackson said, you know, I just cannot do anything to help any of those people because as soon as I do, they're just like a bunch of school children. And he'll go out and he'll tell everybody in the house that I've got that guy Jackson in my pocket. So uh, uh, he, I've learned to just, just keep my mouth shut when these people come in to talk to me about it. Did Jackson never really sought elective office, but at earlier points in his life had kind of flirted with it. Did he ever talk he, about that path? He not never taken? did. Uh, not, at least not that I can remember. Right. Right. Not that I can remember. Nor did he, that I can remember, speak about his relationships with Franklin Roosevelt. If he, it's entirely possible that he did, mm -hmm. but I just don't remember it. And I'm sorry, because it would be very helpful to you if I could remember it. But unfortunately, I can't. Okay. 
What about Jamestown, New York? Did you ever hear him talk about his yeah. roots? Yeah, he did. He did talk about the fact that as, as a lawyer. Uh, as a matter of fact, while I was here, while I was there, I helped him write a law review article about, uh, not about Jamestown, but about nearby areas in Pennsylvania with uh, some interesting litigation from in which the participants were descendants of Sir John Falstaff. Uh, and uh, I also remember his frequently made remark that I learned about the law from the mistakes that I made when I was a lawyer in Jamestown. Did you talk about his family? Did you get any sense of his mom, his dad? Not that I can remember, yeah. no. Uh, I, I met his, I met Bill, I met Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, I used to see Bill from time to time. Uh, in, in years later on, I was very, always very fond of Bill. And, and Bill, considering the fact that he was supposedly working in New York, used to show up reasonably often at the court. Really? Mm -hmm. Just to say hello, or did just, he listen to arguments? No, or? I think it was just to say hello. Yeah. Of course, they had an office in Wa Washington, he probably had occasion to come down there. Right. Bill, you know, became the senior partner. Mm -hmm. you know. Did you have a sense of Justice Jackson consulting Bill about court issues? If he did, I wasn't aware of it. I have seen in your book yeah, there have been occasions when he did it, and I suppose it's a natural thing. Sure, sure. Father, son, lawyer, lawyer. Yeah, yeah. Right. Was there anybody else that Justice Jackson may have been talking to outside of his clerks that you're aware of that he could sort of bounce things off? I, we mentioned Fairman as somebody up there in Stanford. Right. Did you have any sense of anybody else? That There's a fellow named Sidney Davis used to come in from time to time. I don't know if they talked about court matters. I think it might have been just personal. Um, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I mean, there were a whole lot of people who came in to see him, but I, unfortunately, this is occurring 30 years too late. Yeah, no. uh, Eugene Gerhardt. Who was doing the biography at the time and periodically never met him. Never met him. You don't recall any no. conversation about what no. was going on with his biography? No. Okay. What about Bud Phillips, who was the Columbia historian who was working with the papers and doing the oral history? I learned about him from your book. For me, okay. But I never met him, no. Okay. okay. Um, Mrs. Jackson? Was she somebody you I met Jackson? her. I met her. But that's all. That's all I can say. Were there social opportunities to get together at the Jackson household uh, in Hickory Hill? Did you? Uh, there were, mm -hmm. but I, I think I was out, I was I was invited I invited out there twice. Right. And I think you were talking to Barrett earlier today about uh, Barrett Prettyman about going there to work. I mean. Yes. What was that about? Can't remember, but I do know that there was. A, at least one occasion when I get, when I uh, when I did go out there uh, in connection with, with with work, what it was I can't remember. And that was legal work, not physical work. L legal work, yes. He didn't have you train the horses, did he? <laughs> he he was a pretty a pretty good horseman. Right. Did you have a sense of any health issues, or was he in vigorous? No, no. I was. I said that in my note to you last year. Right. Um, I would would never have thought that he was that, that he was that close to serious health problems. I thought he was really at, at the very height of his power, mm -hmm. uh, and and um, no no reason to believe. Uh, I think that that he did have some kind of a minor problem uh, toward the end of the term, which was but nothing nothing serious. Right, I think a thyroid operation. Could be, um, could be. And I believe it was not serious. I mean, mm. It was not related to any yeah. of heart trouble the next year. But, I, you know, he never missed a day. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, no, it was a, it, it was a shock when he went, 
out so quickly. I guess he must have known toward the end that he didn't have very far to go. I think that's right. I think that's right. But I never got that impression. Interestingly enough, in a auction catalog just the other day, I saw a card which he sent to an individual dated May May fifteenth, nineteen fifty four, where he announced that I'm getting up out of my bed. I got to go to court on Monday. And, no. and things, you know, and, and some decisions will be made, period. And that was probably for the Brown case. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it was just one of those, whoa, we better get this. So, and it, since the auction had come and gone, but we made an extra effort to make track down the guy who owns it to get a copy of it for our files. But it's, it's quite a good note. Yeah, it's right there. Right. <laughs> Didn't tell you what he's deciding or anything else, but it was one of those, I'm feeling better and I got to get out and go to court. We're going to switch tapes here for just a second. How you doing, Dad? 